All right, so you guys have probably seen this slide before. Um, I just want to reiterate how. Um, now let me just turn my. How important it is to have. Uh, how okay. <laughs> get settled again. Um, for a native species, it is so deeply, deeply entwined with its environment um, that you can see here all of the the lines showing how it's you know connected with parasites and pathogens. Um, Sixty six primary parasites, 23 parasites of those parasites, and then six parasites of the parasites of the parasites. Um, this is why for most native species, if the environment doesn't change radically, um, they're not a huge ecological issue because they're so tied into their environment. Then you compare that with something like emerald ash borer or a lot of other invasive species. They just don't have that web, and so there's not that stability. Um, and that's a really important thing to remember because not everybody gets that about why invasives are are uh, important. So where is emerald ash borer? This is our current map. Um, so we've got the um, up north. We have have uh, just a small infestation and we have a fairly much larger infestation down south. Um, looking a little more closely, you can see we've uh, up north in 2018, we found it first just by visually checking um, trees, and we were able to see where EAB was right adjacent to the infestation in um, Edmonston Can in New Brunswick. And then we put out a lot of purple traps, um, and uh, we found uh, several positive purple traps, of most up at, right in the area of Madawaska, but um, there were a couple down in Grand Isle. And then also on the Canadian side, just across the river from, from our two positives, there was a positive trap um, um, on the Canadian side. None of us have been able to find anything else uh, about what's happening there. We have three beetles on three traps, um, one on each trap. And uh, we have put in many uh, trap trees right around that area and have not found anything in those trap trees. So we don't know quite what's going on. I do wonder whether um, um, an infested ash tree along the banks of the river uh, might have fallen into the river uh, during the flood season and drifted down river. But you would think if we have a, an established population in this area, we would have picked them up with trap trees, but we haven't yet. So um, this seems to be a still a fairly small infestation and it's not really growing yet um, in 2019, even though we put in a lot of trap trees. Um, we did not find any um, positives, so that's encouraging. Down south, it's a little bit of a different story. So down south, we started out um, finding EAB on just a couple of traps, um, and we didn't have any other information about where EAB was. And so we um, did some branch sampling the following spring, late winter, and we did find EAB in a couple of branches up here and down here. Um, and then in the in September, we found another branch, positive branch sample from down here. But we still didn't know anything other than just right along the edges of the of the New Hampshire or yeah, the New Hampshire border. Then in September, we found it in a purple trap up here in Portland. Um, meanwhile, in the spring, we had set out a whole pile of girdle trap trees all throughout York County as well as other parts of the state. And in the fall, when we girdled them, we found all of these little green trees that you can see, those were all positives. So we found them down as far south as Kittery um, and then out in Lemington um, and Alfred, um, which was a little further spread than, than I had hoped, but it was it was good to know. And so the, the purple or the, uh, the trap trees turned out to be a really um, useful, useful tool. It allowed us to see that um, EAB is definitely spreading throughout um, the southern part of Maine. Um, in Portland, all we have is one purple trap that has one beetle on it. Uh, in the spring, back in the beginning of March, we did a fairly extensive uh, branch sampling program with the, uh, with the city of Portland, and we found nothing. Um, we did about 27 trees. We, we sampled at least two branches from each of these trees. And um, 
we couldn't find anything, which suggests to us that probably um, this infestation in Portland is still fairly early on um, and it's still a fairly small infestation and we may have lucked out and found it fairly, fairly quickly. Um, we are currently in the um, process of girdling several trap trees in Portland um, and hopefully that will give us a little bit more information about where EAB is, is in Portland. But at this point in time, it looks like the population might be relatively low still. Um, so then that's just uh, summarizing it. I expect you are certainly seeing that the population down here in, um, in the southern part of the state is expanding faster than the population up north. That makes sense. Up north, this is just um, a fairly small point source of, of EAB. There were 50 giant ash, white ash trees that were infested, um, but the, the EAB seemed to be fairly lazy over there in Edmiston and they didn't, um, they didn't seem to move much beyond those ash trees. Those ash giant trees were removed. And anywhere that we found EAB up there, it seemed to be only a two or three year um, infestation. Most of them were basically, we'd seen EAB was there for two years. Um, so that is still relatively small um, and, and is going to probably for a little while um, expand a little more slowly. Also EAB um, is in ash trees, black ash up north, um, almost exclusively black ash. And we know that black ash is a lot more susceptible. It dies more quickly than, than white ash does. And it also dies with a fewer number of, of beetles in the tree. So a white ash tree can be just loaded with, with EAB, just riddled with it. Um, no, not a square centimeter of cambium left anywhere. Um, whereas a black ash tree will die much more quickly um, and be kind of a scattered, there's a EAB here and EAB there, um, and lots of, lots of cambium left and the tree just dies. So a white ash tree uh, can produce thousands and thousands of, of um, EAB before it dies, where a black ash tree will die after only maybe a, a, a hundreds of, of EAB being produced. So that might also be slowing the spread up north. Down south, it's a completely different story. There, we're just sort of the leading edge of this giant front that's coming through. And so it's not unexpected to find EAB uh, moving a little faster down south. Um, and this is probably a good point to just remind you again of what Mike talked about last week, um, of the quarantine on, on Emerald Ash Borer. So basically, roundwood, lumber, um, both of those can be moved with a compliance agreement. So if you get a compliance agreement and you move it to a, a facility that has a compliance agreement, those can be moved. Um, chipped material, that needs to be chipped to a certain size for it to be legal to move. Hardwood firewood um, needs to be heat treated in order for it to be legal to move. And rooted ash, there is nothing that anybody can do in any way, shape or form to make it legal to move ash out of out of uh, the quarantine area. So nursery stock and other live ash trees, they just do not move out of the out of the quarantine area. So I want to talk a little bit sort of more, slightly more advanced on, on what we're doing with detection. Um, and D-shaped exit holes that we've been talking about ad infinitum, um, don't count on it. We just, we, they're not easy to see. Even those trees up in, up at Edmonston a couple of years ago that were just loaded with, with emerald ash borer. There were people there that had been working with EAB for a long time and none of us could easily find um, D-shaped exit holes. They were there, but they weren't, they weren't that obvious. Um, so don't count on on finding finding exit holes. It's not not going to be something we we see much of. Um, so crown decline. That's another big thing, and that's basically what we normally one of the the first things that that people will see. The problem with this is in Maine, our ash trees are declining. Um, and it's all throughout the state that we're seeing pictures of, this is actually a picture of EAB 
what we see throughout the state is ash trees that look just like this. Whole banks of them declining. The decline will spread from one edge of the field, you know, along the, the field edge, one area all the way down. Trees will, will sometimes end up dying. Sometimes they're just in severe decline. Um, and as much as we can tell, it's probably due to um, partly site conditions, probably a large part of it has to do with, with previous damage, um, possibly even ice storm damage from 15, 20 years ago, um, and, and leading to fungal issues. And a lot of this has probably been exacerbated by the um, drought conditions that we've had. And so we're seeing this all throughout Maine. Um, symptoms that look pretty much exactly like emerald ash borer. Um, I've talked to my colleagues in other states and they say that, you know, once EAB becomes very well established, they can often tell um, when, when a tree, visually, when a tree is dying of emerald ash borer, but I'm not sure how much they have this other decline as well. At this point in time, I've only seen, you know, maybe one tree up north that I could look at and say, yeah, that's probably EAB. It's not the other general decline that we're seeing. Um, in general, in Maine, we have not been seeing visual decline of our ash trees that have EAB yet. In fact, all of the ash trees that we have found EAB in, in, in trap trees and, and branch sampling, those trees have all still looked really, really healthy. Our trees have not started to die in a big way yet. So you're not necessarily going to tell just from looking at a tree that is declining. You still need to look for this um, and, and make note of it. But if you send me a picture, I'm probably not going to be able to say, yes, that's EAB or not. No, that's not EAB. In the end, what we're going to have to do is either cut that tree down and look for, um, peel the bark off and look for signs of EAB, or we'll have to put in a trap tree um, and peel that in the, in the fall. So um, there's a, a couple of things that I look at um, when I'm, I'm looking at, at crown decline that might give me a bit of a clue as to whether or not it's EAB or not EAB, this other decline. Um, if you see, you know, if you look at the crown and some branches are completely dead and others still look pretty healthy and they've got full sized leaves, that might not be EAB. If you see a more uniform thinning, um, like you can see in this picture here, um, then it may be, um, that may be more likely to be emerald ash borer uh, because e EAB will tend to attack throughout the entire crown. Um, whereas when we have some of these fungal issues, you know, a, a single branch might die or several other branches might die, but some of the branches remaining may still look healthy. That's not absolute, but that's sort of one of the things that I look at um, trying to guess whether it's EAB or whether it's other ash decline. Um, woodpecker activity, another really good source of, of you know, finding, seeing um, emerald ash borer. Uh, they do a really good job uh, feeding on, on the, the, uh, the larvae. Um, again, I've heard in other states people say, oh, anytime you see woodpecker feeding, that's always emerald ash borer. In Maine, that's definitely not the case, possibly because we don't have that much EAB yet, and so our woodpeckers haven't gotten lazy, and they're they're still going after the scrawny little uh, um, bark beetles, native bark beetles. Uh, maybe when there's lots of EAB, they forgo those, and, and you know they just go straight for the for the EAB. But for right now, we do sometimes see um, woodpecker feeding that is not EAB. Um, one of the things that you can look at if you do see woodpecker feeding, is look for these actual holes that are right down into the bark. Um, when woodpeckers are feeding on bark beetles, the bark beetles are overwintering in the bark, and so they tend to have fairly shallow holes. Um, and, and if you can... Um, so if you can see, you know, if the bark is... is if you know the bark is roughly an inch deep and if this hole that you're you're seeing looks like it goes down you know right to the cambium layer all the way through the bark then that's a, a chance that it might be emerald ash borer um, 
if you take a look at uh, if, if you see blonding that's as bad as, as this this tree here on the uh, left, then that almost certainly is emerald ash borer. We never see anything um, any feeding on on native bark beetles that looks like that. So one of the things that you can do if you if you have a pair of binoculars is look up at the um, at the uh, woodpecker feeding and see if you can see the holes. If they look like they're deep holes, that you know raises a suspicion that it probably is emerald ash borer and not bark beetles. Um, the other thing is if you have a draw shave and if that, that uh, if you can get to that area where there's been feeding where there are woodpecker holes, if you can just pair down, shave down through the bark to the cambium layer, you'll be able to see any gallery that is there. Um, so that's one of the things that I do when I can. Some of the other typical um, symptoms that we see are bark splitting and um, the epicormic growth. The epicormic growth, that growth that comes up as, as the tree is, is dying and is kind of the last ditch attempt to stay alive, um, that we do also see um, on trees that are declining for ash trees that are declining for other reasons. Um, and bark splitting, if you see bark splitting, again, if you can take a knife or a draw shave or a hatchet or something and just peel back the bark a little bit, if you can see galleries underneath of it, that will tell you that it's EAB. Um, so this sort of goes back to a little bit to uh, Aaron's talk when he said that uh, that for for pathology, it was a lot, lot more difficult to find what was going on with a tree than it was for us entomologists. And I generally agree with them. I generally thank my lucky stars that I grew up to be an entomologist and not a pathologist, because I think my work is a whole lot easier than his. Um, but where that breaks down is for emerald ash borer, where our symptoms are confusing and ambiguous and easily confused with, with you know, other common issues that, that ash trees are having. Um, and where the, the insect is small and cryptic and hidden. And so we cannot easily tell where EAB is. And, and basically, to be really sure, you have to see the galleries, you have to see the insect, and that means taking the bark off the tree, whether that's felling a tree and peeling it or, or creating a, a trap tree. So um, you, can, you can somewhat tell, you can take a guess as to whether or not you need to look more closely at a tree, but um, you have to be pretty invasive in order to tell for sure. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is the galleries. And you guys have seen these galleries, this, this single um, gallery there. That's what we're pretty much seeing now when EAB levels are really low. Nice, clean, obvious galleries with those S-shaped um, S shaped tracks. Nice, continuous, sinuous track. Over on the right, you can see what it looks like when there's an awful lot of EAB and they basically just go anywhere they can to find some uneaten cambium. And so that that nice, neat, sinuous track kind of breaks down, but it still is a very continuous um, gallery. They don't stop and start and go back. Um, one of the other th other um, beetles that we often see, this is one of the native longhorn beetles. Um, at first glance, it might look a little bit like emerald ash borer, but you can see that there are dead ends and there are Y forks and there are T intersections and the beetle is not traveling in one long continuous, um, you know, long, continuous track. And so that is something to look at um, if you if you do peel up, peel off the bark. And, and sometimes I have gone down to um, to areas where where I've seen a lot of ash decline, and I can see trees that have uh, dead branches where the the bark has sloughed off, and with a pair of binoculars, I can look up and and see the actual tracks of of beetles. And if I and usually what I've been seeing is is this sort of track, um, which is the the native longhorn beetles coming in on trees that are stressed and dying for other reasons. Um, and so that, again, is something to take a look at as you're seeing dead trees if, if the bark has sloughed off. See, you know, did that die because there was EAB? Do you see EAB tracks or do you see tracks that are obviously something not EAB? And then just another, um, another picture of, of the S-shaped galleries. Um, even when they're all convoluted, you can see that they are still one long continuous gallery. 
Um, we there are four larval instars of EAB, and um, we don't necessarily expect non entomologists to be able to identify EAB and tell it from other um, other larval uh, wood borers. But the young EAB, the first three instars, they do have that very bell shaped um, segmented look to them. And um, over on the right here, you can see that's the fourth instar and it gets curled up into that U shaped curl um, when it's getting ready to pupate. And uh, so that that is pretty distinctive as well. Again, another picture of, of EAB larvae. Down here on the right, that's a longhorn beetle larvae. Longhorn beetles tend to have larger heads um, and and they are commonly found in, in um, ash, especially ash that are declining and dying because they come in to colonize the trees that are that are dying. Um, again, we don't expect you to be able to identify this, but if you can't, if you do see um, larvae, send us pictures or save the larvae um, because I can often tell you EAV or not EAV. Um, I won't necessarily be able to tell you exactly what it is if it's not EAB, um, but um, we should be able to identify it um, as far as, as uh, is it something we need to be concerned about or not. And then you guys have, I know I've, I've see, shown pictures of, of um, tiger beetles. In comparison with emerald ash borer before, um, I'm already getting pictures of, or phone calls, sorry, from people who are saying, yeah, I absolutely definitely saw emerald ash borer, even though we're still, you know, a good month or more before we're going to be able to see um, EAB. Um, so people, people see that bright metallic green and they're going to say it's absolutely EAB. They, they cannot a non-entomologist cannot see some of those fine differences. Um, the fact that, you know, tiger beetle has longer legs, it's got these kind of distinct shoulders to it. Um, what they see is a small bright green insect. So often what I have found when you're talking to people um, is to, to ask them about the behavior. Um, and an emerald ash borer generally just hangs out on, on, uh, on ash trees on ash wood, you're not going to find it flying around, um, landing on you, landing on the ground at your feet. If you see something that lands on the ground at your feet and then you walk towards it, it jumps up, flies away. That's almost certainly tiger beetle because that's that's what they do. They're very active predators. And so I find that behave, describing the behavior of a tiger beetle rather than trying to describe the um, the um, the look of it is probably going to net you a little bit better results um, in terms of convincing people that maybe they have not seen um, an emerald ash borer. So um, what we are doing for monitoring, this year we are again doing trapping for emerald ash borer, so you will see the purple traps out and about. Um, we're only going to be doing about 200 or so, and all of those traps will be outside of the, um, outside of the quarantine zone. Uh, Inside the quarantine zone, we do have a lot of these green funnel traps. Um, a lot. We've got maybe, I think, 25 or so. And so we are looking for partners to partner with us um, for hanging the green funnel traps. We can supply the traps um, and the lures and everything that is needed. What we're looking for from a partner is um, somebody who's willing to just check the trap every two weeks. Um, collect the beetles that are there in the in the little funnel or the little container at the bottom of it, um, and um, and so we're looking for towns, uh, conservation districts, land trusts, um, individuals, anybody who is interested in doing that um, and can hang that in an ash tree, uh, we'll we will happily supply that. Um, now, and it's a fairly straightforward thing to do, but it's just something that's um, a little bit more than we are going to be able to to do um, and to have a a trap run around the entire state every two weeks to to uh, to monitor these. So we are looking to have to have some uh, some uh, cooperators. 
So you'll you'll probably see the the purple traps. Some towns may end up buying the green prism traps. They look basically they're the same um, construction as the purple traps, but they're bright or bright uh, neon green. Uh, and both of those basically act in a similar way. We are also still doing the girdled trap trees. Um, we have found that was fairly very effective. Um, uh, at identifying where EAB was in areas that we hadn't found it in other ways, either visually or with, with traps um, or with um, biosurveillance. And so again, we are looking for as many partners as we can to uh, to create girdle trap trees. Uh, and I know you guys have have created girdle trap trees in the past and, and we'd love for you to do that again. Um, I, it's even more important now because we know that EAB is spreading throughout Maine. So we are doing girdle trap trees both within the quarantine zone because we want to see how um, EAB is spreading. Um, and then we're also doing it outside the quarantine zone because we want to know if other hotspots um, uh, crop up. One of the other things we are doing with girdle trap trees is we are um, using them to, to uh, monitor the spread of EAB two areas where we hope to do biological control. And so that worked for us fairly well this year. Um, a lot of our trap trees that we created last year were we created or we uh, girdled those trees um, in really good stands of emerald ash or of, of ash trees, stands that met the criteria for um, the federal government for APHIS to give us um, parasites. And so because the parasites need to have uh, a good good population of emerald ash borer actually in trees in order for us to for, for in order for them to survive. Um, APHIS has fairly stringent uh, restrictions on on what the the conditions are that they will give us um, trap tree or give us um, parasites. And so we were able to find six good sites for parasite release down in York County. Um, this year because of strategic uh, strategic placing of our, our trap trees last year. And so that's what we will be doing again this year. So if you can create trap trees in areas where there are lots of ash, um, especially down in, in areas that are somewhat close to the leading edges, um, then we, uh, as soon as we find EAB in those trap trees, we can go move right ahead on on starting to release biocontrol as soon as we can get it. So speaking of biological control, um, right now, you know, in in Maine, woodpeckers are our best biological control, and in basically in any infestation, in the early stages of an infestation, the woodpeckers are the best biological control. They can cause over 90% of mortality within individual trees. They don't necessarily go to every tree. They tend to go back to a tree again and again until they basically clean it out of, of all EAB. Um, but they are a really strong biocontrol agent. How the problem is, is that they're generalist predators. They're not you know, focused only on emerald ash borer. And so because of that, um, because they don't have a, a density dependent response to, to emerald ash borer, which means that the populations of, of woodpeckers don't skyrocket in the same way that that uh, EAB populations skyrocket. They cannot control EAB in the long run. And as, a, as an infestation gets bigger and more extensive, um, the woodpeckers just basically can't keep up. So they're not going to control EAB, but in early stages, they can really keep the population down. And also, they are a really good early warning system. Um, when you see this kind of, of woodpecker flecking, this blonding, then you know that there may be um, there may be emerald ash borer there. So, so biocontrol, they are a good a good early biological control agent. For later on, um, that's when we start using the the parasites, and we have been releasing all three of these parasites. Um, this year we released them just up in um, in northern Maine because we didn't have have good populations down south. Did, didn't have good sites down south. Um, we also have just I've also discovered that 
it's probably not a good idea to call them parasitic wasps because people hear the word wasp and they freak right out, especially now with the murder hornet. Um, and so I'm trying to get in the habit of calling them beneficial insects um, or natural enemies. Um, they are very tiny and I'm just going to quickly show them to you. This is Ubius agrilli. You see that speck there on the um, on the lid, not the one in the center, the one up at the top, that's Ubius grilli. It's really, really tiny. It's an egg parasite. Here you can see um, on the first picture right up here is is the, um, no, sorry, right up here is the uh, uh, Tetrastigus planipennisi. It is a slightly larger parasite, still very small, has a short ovipositor, is good for working in the upper crowns of trees where the bark is thinner, and also on younger trees. And then this is Spathius gallinae, a slightly larger parasite. As you can see, it's got a longer, um, a longer ovipositor here. Uh, and so it is. it works a little bit better on more mature trees. Both these last two, Spathius and Tetrasticus, have been shown to, to move and spread quickly and follow emerald ash borer. Um, people do ask about, you know, are they going to attack other insects? They have been tested against other insects. Um, there's always a slight possibility that something unexpected might happen. But if that's the case, the only thing that they could possibly attack would be species that are very closely related to emerald ash borer. So that would be other agrilla species. They're not going to go after hum bumblebees. They're not going to go after your dog. Um, and so we can say that fairly, fairly confidently that that, you know, some of them, uh, most of the these two species, the, or the the two larger species do not go after anything other than emerald ash borer. The egg parasite, they have found that if they gave it no choice and they they uh, kept it in a small container with only eggs of of a couple of the other agrilla species that they would occasionally lay their eggs in, in other agrilla species but it's a fairly low low risk um so what we are doing with um with the biological control is we are releasing them you can see here, um, this is sort of a timeline of the emerald ash borer invasion wave. And this dotted green line is, is the numbers of emerald ash borer that are out there. So we are right here, kind of down around here, around year two or so. And the, the number of, of EAB is still fairly low. The population is going to be rising um, over the next few years. And as the population rises, uh, the EAB parasites that we are releasing that are right down here, they should have lots and lots of EAB to feed on and their numbers will hopefully rise quickly, but they're not even gonna begin to touch this, this peak of you know, millions and millions of, of emerald ash borer. The population will rise you know, probably along the lines of, of this, you know, very slow. But when all of the ash trees that are out there die off, and um, the population of EAB crashes and to come along at fairly low levels in the years afterwards, this sort of this post-crest period, that's when we're hoping that the EAB will be, um, will be somewhat controlled by the parasites. And there is some evidence to show that this seems to be happening in other areas where they have been releasing um, these, these parasitic wasps. So, we don't know for sure yet because we're still at the very beginning and we're still learning a lot about um, EAB and, and biocontrol of EAB, mm -hmm. but you know, we are definitely not going to save the trees that are standing now um, and with, with biological control. They, they will be for this aftermath forest and, and that's when hopefully the, the biocontrol will come into their own. So other things that can be used, um, insecticide applications are definitely a possibility, um, particularly in urban areas. Um, they're a good tool for towns. They're a good tool for, for um, people who want to save yard trees, uh, high value trees. The, the pesticides are systemic. They can be used with trunk injections soil drenches um, or basal bark sprays. The most effective um, pesticide is, um, 
is tri triage um, uh, amivectin benzoate, and that needs to be treated as a, as a trunk injection. So there is a fairly high-tech piece of equipment that is used for trunk injection that is kind of, kind of expensive to, it's not something that every landowner is going to have for themselves. Um, but that, that pesticide is about as close to a silver bullet, I guess, as a pesticide gets. It has over 90% efficacy, so it kills kills over 90% of the emerald ash borer in a tree. Um, the effects last for, the label says two years, but effectively we're seeing that the effect lasts for about three years. Um, and and so it's, uh, it is more expensive, but it lasts for a longer period of time. Um, the, uh, the pesticide applications can protect the landscape trees. Um, for cities and towns, it can often be cheaper in the long run than removing trees. And that sounds a little bit counterintuitive, but um, if keeping trees alive is sometimes one of the one of the cheaper options um, than you know more and cheaper than than removing trees and certainly cheaper than if you have to try to replace trees that you take out in, in a in an urban sitting setting. Um, the, one of the other things that treating a tree with pesticides can do is that it can reduce the um, the density of emerald ash borer. And if some of the trees are treated, that means that they are not producing emerald ash borer. And so there are fewer EAB out there. And so the tr remaining trees that are untreated have less of pressure on them and they will survive longer. Uh, there is a, a really good... Uh, uh, pamphlet or booklet set put out um, by APHIS, um, uh, or actually by the universities. And, and we have a link to it at, on our website. It's called Insecticide Options for Protecting the Ash Trees from EAB. It is written in a fairly easy to understand uh, way, and it just sort of gives a good framework for people who are trying to understand, you know, how do I want to, how do, what do I want to do with my trees? Do I want to protect them? How do I protect them? Um, and it, it it does a really good job of, of laying out the pros and cons of different ways of, of treating treating trees. So I would highly recommend that for any of you guys that are in an area where people are asking questions about emerald ash borer and protecting their trees um, to, to, uh, to print that off and, and familiarize yourself with it. Um, in terms of when you need to uh, uh, treat trees, uh, generally the, the rule is, you know, when EAB is 10 to 15 miles, discovered 10 to 15 miles away, you can start treating your trees. Right now, Maine is still doing fairly active um, monitoring for Emerald Ash Borer. So that 10 to 15 mile um, rule of thumb is basically if, if you're not actively looking for EAB, then if, if you find EAB 10 to 15 miles away, then there's a good chance you have it where you are. Um, for us, you know, we found it in, in Portland. We don't necessarily think that people should go you know, within 50 mile radius of Portland should all start treating their trees. One of the best things to do is just to monitor. Um, and if you can put in a trap tree, if you can put up traps, if you can just watch your trees and look for signs of emerald ash borer, if you are actively monitoring, you don't need to start treating right away yet. Um, in Portland, we are treating some of the, the very high value trees, um, even though we haven't seen any signs of emerald ash borer in those trees yet. Um, just to be on the safe side, but um, so that that just wanted to to mention to you that that ten to fifteen mile um, response or, or or ten to fifteen mile recommendation is for people that are not necessarily or in states that are not necessarily doing doing heavy monitoring. Other things that can be done: um, harvesting large trees. Uh, for the landowner, for a woodlot owner, is especially important. Uh, Nate Siegert's work has shown that that somewhere around, I think, 12% of the largest trees are the ones that are producing over 80% of the emerald ash borer. So if you can take your large tree out, your large trees out, you will get the value of those trees for a landowner. Um, but they will also then reduce the um, the pressure on on the other trees and and that is something that that is is 
probably a good thing for people to do, you know, especially down in the south where we know that EAB is, is moving in um, fairly quickly. Get in there and take out your larger trees. Um, we don't we don't recommend that they take out all of the trees because we really want to keep the smaller trees on the landscape. Um, but those smaller trees also produce less in the way of emerald ash borer. Girdled ash trees. Um, we talked about I talked about um, ash trees as girdled trees as uh, a monitoring method, but they also can be um, uh, a method of of uh, keeping the population down. And again, this is something that is important early on in a in a infestation. So what the process is, is you basically just cluster small or, or you, you girdle small clusters of ash trees, two or three ash trees um, here and there throughout your ash stands. Um, and those trees act as sinks and um, EAB will, will have a tendency to come more to those trees and leave your other ash trees alone. And then you leave those trees up during the during the fall and the winter and let the woodpeckers do what they can on, on those trees. Um, and then the spring, you fell those trees. Most of the EAB in those trees are probably going to be the younger um, EAB. They won't be ready to emerge, um, pupate and emerge as adults. And so you don't even need to necessarily take those trees out. If it's if it's inconvenient to do so, you can just fell them, buck them up. The trees will die, dry out and, and the EAB and the most of them will die. And so you can do this. You can basically, in the early part of an infestation, you can suck the emerald ash borer out of out of the environment into those trees away from from your other ash trees. Um, it has even been found that if you have a cluster of girdled trap trees off to one edge of, of you know, an ash stand that you are perhaps trying to save, that um, you can actually influence the spread of the direction of the spread and and take them away from from your the trees you're trying to save this does eventually break down this works primarily best in the early stages of an infestation so for those first several years um but it is one more thing that people can do and and i do know of a couple of small woodland owners in maine that are primarily firewood producers and they are planning on doing this um, and it will be interesting to see how that works for them So this is the picture that I showed you of EAB infestation wave. Um, so basically what happens is we are here on this kind of the cusp of, of, of EAB. We have very low numbers of EAB. We're not starting to see a whole lot of tree death. The tree death is a solid um, red line. Um, and Um, so we are in an area where we're basically, for much of the state, we're still in the, the prevention mode, trying to keep EAB from spreading, having our quarantine, that's one of the most important things we can do to, to stop EAB from spreading, Taking using this time that we have to prepare for emerald ash borer. Those are things that we can do before you know the EAB starts to, to take off. Um, now in, in southern Maine and in northern Maine, we're starting to get into that sort of response phase where we need to respond to EAB that is here. And, and you know, within a year or two, we're going to see that our populations of EAB start to rise exponentially. And, and then concurrently, we're also going to see that trees are starting to die exponentially. At this point in time, we're not seeing tree death yet. Um, but that could change. Up north, that's probably going to change this year. We're probably going to see trees that are dying from emerald ash borer. Down south, we probably still have a little bit longer. Um, and so, yeah, I also wanted to just to mention that in the end, you know, EAB is not going to disappear entirely. It's going to stay kind of down at low levels. As young trees grow up, EAB may move into them. Um, and so there's always going to be just a low fluctuating level of EAB. Tree mortality is going to be pretty high, um, not necessarily 100%, but but there will be some trees that come back, they start to grow up, and then when they get become susceptible to EAB, uh, big enough to be susceptible to EAB, they will die. And so you'll have a high level of, of mortality um, and, or a low number of trees and, and a low number of emerald ash borer. 
Um, this is sort of the recovery phase of, of, of emerald ash borer, or the aftermath forest. Um, and that's something that a lot of research is being done on right now to see what exactly is happening in the aftermath forest. Um, how do trees grow? What, what is the population of emerald ash borer? How does biological control happen and, and work in, in the, the aftermath forest? So that's a lot of a lot of work that will be coming out. The effect of, of management tools, whether it's pesticides, whether it's girdle trap trees, whether it's taking out your larger um, ash trees uh, in a in a stand, it actually does have an effect. Um, in the parlance of COVID-19, it does not flatten the curve. You still will get EAB um, killing your trees. But what it does do is it moves that curve further away. So instead of, you know, after, you know, instead of having your maximum mortality at around, oh, say eight years after you first discover emerald ash borer, or after emerald ash borer first moves in, all of a sudden now your, um, your peak of mortality comes at, you know, maybe 18 years. So you can buy yourself close to 10 years worth of time before you have a lot of trees dying. And that can be important. Um, and so that's largely what I have. Um, preparing for EAB, uh, I just realized that I'm running out of time here. Um, had a bit of a slow start. Uh, does your town have a management plan? Um, as a landowner, do you have a management plan? Do you know where your ash is and how much you have? Um, are you monitoring? Can you put in a trap tree? That's probably one of the most proactive things you can do. Um, and then, you know, we have a lot of resources. All of these resources are on our main.gov um, slash EAB. And so they're easy to get to, just www.main.gov slash EAB will take you there. Um, and then just at the last, I would like to say, don't get rid of all of your ash. It's really, really important to keep ash on the landscape. Small diameter ash do not produce a lot of emerald ash borer and they might slow the spread of the EAB front. Um, it's important to keep ash and ash seed on the landscape as long as possible because ash seed does not necessarily last for a long time in the seed bank. And so keeping ash there is important. Um, it's going to help biological control be more effective. If we take all the EA, all the ash trees out, the biocontrol is not going to be as effective. And then there's this paper that came out last year that showed that 75% of the white ash in, in Michigan and the area that was sort of ground zero for emerald ash borer, at several sites, 75% of the ash was still alive. Uh, they said about 66% of the basal area. We don't know entirely what that means. Um, in some sites, uh, there was 100% ash mortality. In some sites, there was 100% ash survival, even though EAB had been in there and they could find um, galleries and exit holes and all of the ash trees, the ash survived. And so we don't really know what this means. It may mean that the outlook is not quite as bleak as we originally thought it was. So basically the take home message is we don't know all of the answers yet. Keeping ash on the landscape gives us a lot of options. Um, and, and managing ash, if we can you know, slow the, the spread of, of ash on people's, you know, move that, that, uh, that peak of, of, of ash uh, death further along um, by, by managing ash. 10 years, we may know a whole lot more than we do now. Um, and so that is what I have. And I'm going to go back now, hopefully to Teams and see if we can answer any questions. Mike, are there questions that people typed in? Uh, uh, no, no questions, questions have, have come, come into in the chat. chat. So, so if so folks do have questions and you want to type them in there, I can relay them to Colleen. Or Otherwise, it's a just, pretty small group, so you can yeah, probably you can just, chime in and uh, ask them directly. Uh, here's yeah. a question from Amy Colleen. Can you tell us what causes the bark to split? Um, yeah, so as the EAB is tunneling underneath the bark and feeding on the cambium, that layer of cambium dies. And so 
the bark basically just loses that elasticity. It dries out. It doesn't spread and grow with a tree, and so you tend to get splits, uh, basically because it is dead in that area. Anybody else have a question they want to share in the, the chat box? Allison did go ahead and share a uh, summary of some uh, insecticide treatment options in the chat box there. So if folks are okay. interested in that, they can access it there. There's a link right there. Um, and if anybody okay, has a question, a, you don't have to type it in. You're welcome to, to just yeah. ask. Here's a question from Kathy Murray. What is the responsibility of towns and other organizations for monitoring? Um, no legal responsibility at all. Um, ethical responsibility, that's, that's going to be up to people, up to individual towns, I guess. But um, we are certainly trying to make it as easy as possible for towns to monitor um, in terms of, of giving them the green funnel traps as we can. Uh, we have resources for them if they want to buy traps. Um, we will make it as easy as possible for them to participate in a girdle trap tree program, but they don't have any obligation to join that at all. We really, really encourage them to, though. Okay, and then a follow up from Kathy, followed by a question from Mort. So, first from Kathy is one of the links you posted a guidance document for towns. Yes. Yes. OK, so yes, uh, Kathy, one of those links should get you where you need to go. And then from Mort, are you getting many questions from consultants about how to manage? Um, I have, yes. And so there has been there's been a lot of conversation. Um, certainly, I've I've talked to managers last year quite a bit. You know that that you know they had to cut absolutely every single ash tree down, um, even if EAB is still miles and miles away, um, or you know half a state away. And and we are not encouraging that. We are encouraging a little bit of you know maintaining some ash trees on, on the landscape. So there, there have been conversations. Um, I think some of the, con, some of the, there has been a fair bit of lack of knowledge or lack of education about it. So there've been some really productive conversations about how can you manage, um, what can you do to, to uh, meet the expectations of a landowner while still not having a, you know, Cut, cut everything down. Okay, next we have a question from Julie Davenport. Is there a certain subcategory of pesticide applicator license required for the injection you described? For example, ornamental, or can any pesticide applicator do it? I think oh, that would probably be a question more for the Board of Pesticides Control. Um, I think if you have a license to treat in whatever, you know, treat in in a forest situation or treat in a landscape situation, if you have that license, you can treat. Um, so you, just because it's it requires an injection doesn't mean you need a specific license, I believe. But any specific questions? I would, I would uh, maybe send that to the Board of Pesticides Control. If, does that answer your question, Julie? Feel free yeah. to unmute mute if you want. Yeah, I'm not sure what the core requirements are. You know, Category Two Forest Pest Management and Three A Ornamental would uh, probably be what people that are doing this sort of work would automatically have. As yeah. far as what the legal requirement is, I can't say I know. Um, and then Julie also asks as a follow up, how can landowners find applicators doing this kind of treatment? So we do have a list. You, you can go to the Board of Pesticides Control and they have a list of, of licensed um, pesticide applicators and arborists. Um, we also have a list 
um, on our web page and I can't go there right now, um, but we we do maintain lists of, of people that are licensed. OK, next Bill Hamilton asks if a small woodlot owner wants to hang a purple trap, how would they take part in that program? Um, well, they would talk to Mike Parisio. Uh, we have only 200. Um, 200 uh, purple traps. They need to go in the area that's outside the quarantine zone. So if this landowner is outside the quarantine zone. That would be a possibility. But the traps need to be put in areas that are high risk. Um, so if this is a guy that's off in the middle of nowhere, his his property might not necessarily meet the requirements of of a of, of a place we would want to put a, a purple trap. I would recommend for a small woodlot owner that they contact me about doing a trap tree because that is actually a much a trap tree is a much more effective way of monitoring for emerald ash borer. It's more sensitive than a purple trap is, and it is something that the landowner can do, and and uh, we can then work with him uh, to make sure that he gets his tree girdled, and and then we'll. Sell it and peel it in the fall. Uh, working with them, so I would I would recommend that over a purple trap for a landowner if they can a woodlot owner. Yeah, I second that, Bill. If they're dead set on a purple trap for some reason, and you want to follow up with me, uh, feel free to shoot me an email or put them in uh, touch with me directly. And then a follow up from Jan, going back to Julie's question um, about. Uh, licensing for tree injections. Jan says there wouldn't be any additional licensing requirement per se. It's the equipment. So again, yeah, yeah it's uh, sophisticated equipment that only a certain set of uh, applicators are going to have access to. And most uh, most of the bigger um, tree care companies will probably have that equipment because it can. It, that equipment is used for emerald ash borer. It's used for hemlock, or can be used for hemlock woolly adelgid as well. Um, so I suspect that that more and more people will be starting to have that equipment. Because triage is far and away the most effective of, 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 of the pesticides to be used. OK, do we have any additional questions last minute that folks would like to ask? Colleen, this is Greg Lord. Um, I just back on the maps, I noticed that the, in New Brunswick, they had the quarantines kind of coming down further down the eastern border of Maine. Is it yes. what was the yeah, I'm not sure if you know, but the decision why that's down there and follow up why, you know, is there a reason why we didn't extend it down? OK, yes, thank you for asking that. I meant to mention that and, and didn't. Um, so New Brunswick has found three infestations in the province. All three of them are along the right along the Trans-Canada Highway. And so they quarantined all the counties on the Trans-Canada Highway because there was a feeling that that that's probably how this was moving. Um, and so the quarantine they didn't necessarily quarantine along the border because they wanted to quarantine the border they quarantined along the trans canada highway and because of the shape of the counties um the quarantine came down that far um so that's that's the re the rationale for that the nearest infestation we have the, the one in edmonston there's one right near fredericton and then there's one over closer to the east coast so there's not a lot right close to us in, in New Brunswick. Thank you. Okay, last okay. call for questions. Otherwise, I'll let Colleen send you off. Okay, well, thanks very much, guys.